All right. Now we're in a position to continue with our test of hypothesis. So let's trundle back to the board and put those numbers into our calculation. <clears throat> now let's see. The difference between the two averages is 1.26. And the hypothesized value for A to A minus A to B, that's zero. And one over NA, that would be one over six. And one over NB, that would be one over five. And what do we have for S squared? What is the estimate of the variance in this case? The estimate of the variance in this case will be 6.67. I'll just put it on top there. Now, if we were to go through that particular calculation, we would find out, we'd produce a T with nine degrees of freedom. We'd have T is equal to 1.26 divided down by the square root of 2.44, which is equal to 0 0.8. And now we're ready for the $64 question. Uh, is this value of T an unusual value of T? Now, it's a T with nine degrees of freedom. So first of all, let's look at a T distribution with nine degrees of freedom. And you can all imagine what you're about to see. The T distribution with nine degrees of freedom will be a bell-shaped curve, a very normal-like in appearance. So let's go over and uh, take a good look at the T with the nine degrees of freedom. And here she is. It looks an awful lot like a normal, doesn't it? But it isn't quite a normal. It's a little more squished in the center here and slightly higher in the tails than the normal. All right, now what was our observed value of T? Our observed value of T was 0 0.8. So let's see where that observed value of T falls on uh, this T distribution. There it is, right there. My gracious, that's not a terribly unusual value of T. That's a value of T that happens quite often indeed. And so we would take the attitude that this observed value of T is not unusual. Uh, therefore, the data that we've gathered, the uh, data were 1.26, the difference between the averages, that difference isn't particularly unusual given that A to A minus A to B is equal to zero. And so you see the data do not contradict the hypothesis. The data and the hypothesis have produced an event which is not an unusual event. And hence we say the data do not contradict the hypothesis. We find the hypothesis that A to A minus A to B equal to zero acceptable, or to be a bit safer, not contradicted by the data. Well, now what about the critical values of T with nine degrees of freedom? The critical value of t would be that value of t which left 2.5% in the tail of the curve. And so those critical values are plus or minus 2.26. And once I know the critical values of t, I can do the following. I can construct an interval estimate for the difference between a to a and a to b. So let's do that particular calculation now. Now our statistic that we're worried about uh, is y bar a minus y bar b plus or minus the 1.96 times the square root of the variance of the statistic. This would give me the limits for a to a minus a to b. But uh, alas, as uh, you probably all have already guessed, right, we don't know sigma squared. What we're stuck with is s squared. And when that happens to us, what do we have to do to that critical value of z? We have to replace it by uh, the corresponding critical value of t. To have the critical of the value of t which leaves two and a half percent in the tail of the curve. Alpha in this case is 0.05, and so we want to put two and a half percent in the tail of the curve, and we have to pick up that t which has new degrees of freedom, the same number of degrees of freedom as s squared. Well, that's easy. In this case, we'd be interested in the critical value of t with uh, uh, nine degrees of freedom. Okay. All right, now what we've got to do is uh, substitute away. Now, let's see. 2.26, as I remember it, was the uh, critical value of uh, t. Okay. Now let's see how we do with these other ones. 1 over 5, that must be n sub, 1 over n sub b. Uh, 1 over n sub a is uh, 1 over 6. Uh, s squared, pray, what was s squared? 6.67, so the s squared right on top of that. There we are. y bar a minus y bar b. Well, I remember that's 1.26, so try that. And there are all our substitutions. All nicely stretched out there. Now if we, you know, turn the crank, we'll come out with a 1.26 plus or minus 3.56, and that will provide us with the following uh, set of uh, limits. We're going to find out that the limits for A to A minus A to B are 4.82 uh, down to minus 2.30. And uh, what will my attitude be towards this uh, interval that you see here? My attitude would be that all values of A to A minus A to V 
which lie inside this interval are not contradicted by the data. Now, this is a 95% confidence statement. We could, in point of fact, uh, view this statement uh, uh, slightly more legalistically. And let me put up a longer statement here. We could really say that the probability of this statement being correct is 95%. That is to say that 5% of the time when we make such a statement, we will be incorrect. It's possible that an engineer can construct such an interval statement, and in fact, the interval would not include A to A minus A to B. But the nice thing about 5% is that's a rare event, something that happens with a frequency of 5% or less. And the beautiful things about rare events are, you know, they happen rarely. And so we, uh, you know, we have a mechanism here which all engineers can uh, uh, put to their uh, uh, resourceful use. And so here is a 95% interval statement for the difference between those two means. Uh, it's nice to look at that uh, geometrically. So let's come over here and just take a look at the uh, interval statement geometrically. Let's see, y bar A minus y bar B was a 1.26. That's about here. And the upper limit was 4.82. she goes. And the lower limit was, uh, let's see, minus 2.30. And that, gentlemen, is what this engineer knows about the difference between those two means. His best estimate as to what the difference between those two means is uh, 1.26. But any other value between these two limits is, in fact, is in fact you know, not extraordinary. This is his knowledge about the difference between those two means. You know, he doesn't know very much, does he? Uh, when you get right on to it, zero is well inside the interval, and negative values for that difference are possible, and positive values are possible. So he's not in a very strong position when he argues about the difference between uh, uh, treatment A and or type A and type B uh, motors. Okay. In this case, he'd undoubtedly try to get some more data so he could tighten down on that interval. Now, tightening down on that interval, the width of that interval is a very crucial matter. And this brings us to really our first opportunity to really discuss seriously what we do about designing experiments. And when I design an experiment, I try my level best to get the variance of the statistic as small as possible. Now let's just quickly review what we have here. We had that y bar a minus y bar b was equal to 1.26. And you'll remember that the expected value of that statistic was equal to the parameter. So we have this particular statement that the expected value of that statistic is actually the parameter value a to a minus a to b. And now what is the variance of that particular statistic? Well, we've employed it over and over again, and just to repeat it, the variance of that particular statistic is the following. The variance of the difference between the two averages is 1 over n sub a plus 1 over n sub b sigma squared, when I know sigma squared. When I don't know sigma squared, I plug in s squared, and that would be the estimated variance of the statistic. All right, now, consider the following problem. An engineer comes, and he is given money to manufacture or to purchase or what have you, 12 motors. Now, how would he make a design an experiment to contrast motors of type A versus motors of type B? And the average guy would do the following, and he'd be correct. His intuition would play him fair. He'd get six motors under type A and six motors under type B. You'd all probably do that unconsciously. And why would that be the correct thing to do? Because by so investing your efforts, you make the constant in front of sigma squared as small as possible for a total number of 12 observations. That'd be one six plus one six, or one third sigma squared. Now let's suppose you're just a little casual, a little careless, and you get seven motors for type A. You're sort of fascinated by type A motors. So you get seven motors for type A before it occurs to you, good grief, I've got to get some type B motors. Then you only have five for type B. Well, what about the variance of the statistic now, you see? You'll still get the two averages and the difference between the averages, but now it'd be one over seven plus one over five. And you know something about that? That's larger than one third. You can imagine the guy who takes 11 type A motors and only one type B motor. Good grief, what's his estimate of the difference between the, uh, the results, the average for A and the single observation he gets for B? The variance of that statistic would be, you know, 1.09 sigma squared. That's bigger than the variance of a single observation. That'd be most foolish indeed. Now, suppose we go the whole way. What do you say? We don't take any type B motors. We just 
you know, purchased 12 Type A motors, and then someone comes up to you and says, um, uh, what can you tell me about the difference between Type A and Type B? And you'll notice you can't say a blooming thing, because the variance of the statistic becomes what? Infinite. You have 1 over 12 plus 1 over 0. That gives you a mighty big number, okay? What happens when you sub substitute that mighty big number over here into this uh, uh, T statistic to uh, work up a test of significance, whatever your hypothesized value of eta? Well, you get, you know, it's impossible. That's all. You get a value of T equal to zero. It'll tell you nothing about you aren't able to uh, test the higher distinguish for any value you put in for A to A minus A to B. And what would happen if you tried an interval statement? Good grief. If you try an interval statement, if we take these numbers off here now and, and look at the original equation, what happens if I put no observations in, uh, in B? Well, you know, that becomes 1 over infinity. That makes the limits go from minus infinity to plus infinity. Now, there's no doubt at all that that's an exact confidence statement. You can be sure, you know, 95% of the time and more times than that, that the true difference, a to a minus a to b, lies somewhere between minus infinity and plus infinity. The point at issue is you can't say anything resourceful. And the real point at issue is that when we design an experiment, we try our level best to get the variance of a statistic to be as small as possible. We're interested in what are called minimum variance estimates of the parameters. All right, now let's talk of another subject. Let's talk about the assumptions underlying the T statistic, the use of T. There are three important assumptions underlying the use of T in the derivation of T and in the use of T. And these three important assumptions are independence, normality, and homogeneous variance. Now, homogeneous variance, uh, we have a special word for that in the statistical fraternity. If Walt Disney can have uh, super califragilistic, et cetera, and et cetera, we can have a special word too, and it's called homoscedasticity. You notice the word scedastic is locked in there. And what do you think is the opposite of homoscedasticity? The opposite of homoscedasticity is heteroscedasticity. Whopping big words to impress the, uh, impress the novice and so on. Let's discuss these three assumptions. The assumption of independence is crucial. And what do we mean by independence? We mean that the magnitude and the sign of the errors, which impinge on the data-taking procedure, each error's magnitude and sign has now blooming thing to do with anybody else's magnitude and sign. Any other observations, magnitude and sign. If the magnitude of the error on the third observation is large and positive, it has nothing to do with what's going to happen in the second observation or the third or the seventh or what have you. The errors are independent. This assumption is so crucial, we have to conduct our experiment in a special way to help guarantee it. And we do that by randomization. Some aspect of randomization has to attach itself to every experimental procedure. In this instance, where we had the six versus five motors, we'd write down the letter A six times, the letter B five times, clip up little sheets of paper, dump them in a hat, and pull them out. And as we put those machines on the test rack, we would put them on the test rack or investigate those machines in a random order. Or we would select them randomly off their production lines. Some aspect of randomization is essential. Now, what about the other two assumptions? You can relax the assumption about normality a great deal before you endanger the usefulness of the T statistic not terribly important uh, that the distribution of the observations be normal, just as it was not important for the normal deviant. And what about homogeneous variance? That's crucial in the derivation of T, but it is not at all crucial in the practice of T. And uh, we find out that the variance need not be homogeneous throughout the whole data taking process in order to make T a resourceful statistic. In point of fact, gang, the interesting thing about T is though we require all three assumptions to derive it, we say T is robust, okay? We can use T under quite varying circumstances in practice, and the probability statements we make and so forth will in no way be contradicted. So T is a robust statistic. It's a sort of a super statistic, if you will, and it looks with scorn down upon such items as non-normality and heteroscedasticity.